Good morning, dear friends. It's an honor to have this opportunity to worship with you at Huron Bible Chapel this morning, and doubly so on this very special morning, Good Friday. We're going to do the inquiry this morning of why is Good Friday called Good Friday, and why is it a Good Friday indeed? If you have a Bible uh, close by, turn with me to the book of Hebrews. I'm going to be using a text this morning that you may find a bit uncommon for a Good Friday message, Hebrews chapter 13, and when you get to chapter 13, the last chapter of the book of Hebrews, go to the 15th verse. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. I see this verse parsing or dividing up into three very basic ways. I think the author of Hebrews has put this sentence in a very nice format, the past, the present, and the future. The past we'll start with, and it is the first three words of Hebrews 13 and verse 15 through Jesus, therefore. The middle portion is the present tense. As a result of what Jesus did for us on the cross, we have something that we should be doing. Let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. And then I see that the author of Hebrews, as he works his way through this section, also wants to direct our attention not only to the past and the present of Good Friday, but what does Good Friday do for us in the future? And there we have the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. So I want to start, obviously, with the first three words of this verse. Through Jesus, therefore. Do you notice that the author starts this verse through Jesus? He doesn't start with an I. Would you forgive me for saying that if it was a modern author, chances are he would be starting with an I. Everything's about us. Everything's centered around us. We live in a very egocentric society. It has been said that someday science will find the center of the universe and millions upon millions of people will be shocked that it wasn't them. So true. Here, the author of Hebrews is wanting us to recognize that Good Friday and the events of Good Fridays are about Jesus. We are the beneficiaries, but Good Friday is about what Jesus did. Through Jesus, therefore. Now, when you see the word therefore in your scriptures, you know that you should always ask, what's the therefore, therefore? And so we'll do that this morning. Through Jesus, therefore, and what is that therefore, therefore? Well, we must go back because the author of Hebrews has been building a foundation. And the foundation that he has been building is that Jesus Christ did something very spectacular on Good Friday for us. So spectacular that it even overrides or overrules or trumps, however you want to say it, what the great high priest used to do when he went into the Holy of Holies in the center of the tabernacle. That moment where he offered up sacrifices on behalf of God's people. And what the author of Hebrews is saying is, that's nothing in comparison to what Jesus did. Let's read it. In verse 10, the author says, We have an altar from which those who minister at the tabernacle have no right to eat. In other words, we have something through Jesus Christ that is higher than even what the high priest had while he was in the Holy of Holies. The high priest carries the blood of animals into the most holy place as a sin offering. Now listen, but the bodies are burned outside the camp. And so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing the disgrace he bore. For here we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for the city that is to come. Through Jesus, therefore. 
the author is saying, look at what the great high priest used to do. He would take the blood offering of the lamb and he would go into the most holy place and offer the blood sacrifice to God. The author is saying that is what is the key to the sacrifice. It is the blood. The bodies, the carcasses, the bodies of the sacrifice land were burned outside the camp. No one would burn those bodies where people were living and, and, and dwelling. They went outside the camp. What does outside the camp mean? It means and connotes where it's unsafe, not secure, unclean. The people who had no position in society lived outside the camp. They lived outside the gates. And yet what we have here is we have the, the author of Hebrews reminding us that's exactly what Jesus Christ did for us. In that location that is of no importance and no value to anybody in society, it's outside the camp, that's Golgotha. And that's where Jesus Christ went and died on that cruel cross for us. And in verse 12, and so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. What a wonderful thing that we have through Jesus, therefore. I remind you again of something that I'm sure you have thought about. Nature, to preserve itself, says flee. Some animals, creatures, have camouflage in which they can hide so that they do not become prey. Some animals have great speed in which they can run away and not become the prey. Some animals have great strength in which they can overcome the predator and they do not become the prey. But all of nature is built to survive and to overcome a predator. Paul in Colossians reminds us that Jesus is the developer of all of creation. And yet Jesus, as the developer of creation, did not use any of those powers on Good Friday. The author of the hymn, didn't he say it great? He could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set him free, but he died alone for you and me. In John, we read that great story as it's coming up to the Good Friday message. And, and Jesus is in the garden. And all of these troops come to arrest him. And he is asked, who is Jesus? Where is Jesus? And Jesus simply says this, I am he. And they all fall down. Such power and majesty. But he didn't use it to save himself. He went to Golgotha on a hill outside the camp in disgrace and dishonor to be that servant of God for you and I on Good Friday to take the sins for mankind. Arthur Miller was a minister of uh, a few years back. He wrote on a number of books. In one of his books, he tells the story of his first pastorate. And in his first pastorate, one of the houses that was close by where he lived was uh, right, right in front of the railway tracks. The railway tracks went immediately behind the house of this home. And uh, he was summoned to that house by people to come because a terrible tragedy had occurred. And when he got there, he found out that the following had occurred. The young child in the house was playing on the railway tracks and a train was coming. The child was presumably too young to understand the great danger that she was in. But the mother in the house saw that, ran out, and just before the tra train came to take the life of the child, the mother grabbed the child and threw the child away and into uh, a safety and away from harm. 
but it was too late for her and the train struck and killed her. Arthur Moore says that he spent time with the, the grieving husband, spent time with the family. And after being there for a period of time, as he was walking home, he said to himself, Lord Jesus, this is exactly what you did for us. You saved us by putting yourself in harm's way and you gave your life that we would be saved. That, dear friends, is the past. What a glorious past for us to recognize on Good Friday. Why is this Good Friday good? Because Jesus Christ took the cross for you and I, and he didn't do it in a great ceremony. He didn't do it in great pomp. It, it wasn't done like inside the courthouse square in Godrich so that all could see how wonderful it was, it was on Golgotha, outside the camp, outside the gates, in humiliation, and he did that for you and for I. What a man of sorrows. He took on our sins. That is the past, and that is why Good Friday is so good. Let us now look at the present, the present. That is the middle portion of this verse. Let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. Did you hear that? Let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. Those two words don't seem to go together at times in our life, do they? sacrifice and praise. It's quite easy to praise, come to church and praise and be in a pew and be happy when we're on a mountaintop life experience. It's quite easy to worship when everything's going fine. The author of Hebrews, though, is telling us that because of what Jesus Christ did for us on the Good Friday, we need to join him. He says this, let us then go to him outside the camp bearing the disgrace he bore. And I think that what he's doing in these verses is he's reminding us that we need in our difficult times to continue to praise the Lord. Let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. Well, we're a year through COVID, a year. I don't know about you, but it's starting to wear thin, isn't it? Who knew when we started this that there would be a third wave that we would have to confront? I am missing many things that I used to take for granted. And I'm now doing things that I never ever thought I would do. And our patience is tested. And as a community, our patience is being tested. When we started this in March of last year, everybody was working together as a community. We would we would succeed over this pandemic. But now that we're a year out, wouldn't you grant me that there are cracks in the community? There are cracks in the, we're in this together. There are folks who do not see it that way. And so it's requiring a great deal of patience. And maybe you're there this morning saying, I don't really feel like praising today. Maybe it's something beyond the pandemic. Maybe you're experiencing personal circumstances today that are so significant and so acute in your life right now that you actually have a hard time praising this morning. It is that moment, friends, that I think the author of Hebrews is pointing to right now, that indeed it is at that point in time when we are going through difficulties, when we are going through trials, when we are going through tribulations, that our praise has so much significance. It is our sacrifice of praise. Perhaps the event that you're going through is a little similar to what I was referring to about the pandemic. It just doesn't seem to stop. And the event is requiring you to have great patience. Something few of us really have 
in boundless amounts. And our prayers do not appear to be being heard. And they seem to be bouncing off the ceiling of the room we're in. And we're wondering, where is God in these circumstances? And I ask you right now to contemplate, is it possible that God is actually in the delay? Is it possible that God is using delay as a tool to get our attention in a fresh and a new way? There are three or four wonderful examples in the New Testament where it is clear that delay is indeed a tool in the toolbox of God. But I'm not going to use one of those this morning. I'm going all the way back to the very first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, in the 39th and 40th chapter of Genesis. And I want to talk a little bit about the story of Joseph and Potiphar's wife. Chances are you haven't been in that story for a while, so let me just remind you a little bit of the story. Joseph's a handsome man. Uh, Potiphar's wife notices that. Joseph is a key figure in Potiphar's house. Potiphar's wife wants to spend some time with Joseph. Joseph flees from Potiphar's wife. Now, you would think that that's the end of the story. Great. Joseph's a man of God. He does exactly as he is supposed to do. Next story, please. But that's not how it happens. Potiphar's wife creates a false allegation against Joseph. Joseph is thrown in prison for something that he didn't do. Indeed, he's thrown in prison because he did what was right. Now, if you were Joseph, you might just for a moment in that prison cell wonder if God had forsaken you. But now comes a more difficult aspect of the story, great delay in his being in the prison. Two other prison mates have dreams and Joseph um, interprets the dreams on behalf of both of these prison colleagues. One of them is the cupbearer for Pharaoh. And the cupbearer is released from prison and goes back to Pharaoh's world. And now you would think, okay, he's going to tell Pharaoh, wow, I met the most amazing guy in prison. You've got to talk to him. But the scriptures are very clear. The cupbearer forgot Joseph. What? How is this? anything that should be happening to Joseph, who is improperly imprisoned. And now the delay is accentuated because the guy who could get him released forgets him. Ultimately, Pharaoh himself has a dream and the cupbearer now goes, oh, I so forgot about this friend of mine in prison. You got to get him out. He interprets dreams. And Joseph is put before Pharaoh, and he interprets his dream. And Pharaoh puts him in charge of all of Egypt. No person greater in power in Egypt than Joseph, except Pharaoh himself. What is that story all about? And why was there so much delay? Well, I think a lot of it has to do with the geography. Joseph started as a key figure in Potiphar's house. Potiphar was important, but he wasn't Pharaoh. He finishes as the most important figure in all of Egypt, save and except Pharaoh himself. The delay was used by God to put Joseph exactly where God wanted him. Maybe the delay in your life is because God has something greater than what you could even imagine, or maybe are even praying for. As an aside, you ever wonder when you go through that story what Potiphar's wife thought when she got the government uh, memo stating that Joseph was now uh, the second most important person in all of Egypt and second only to Pharaoh? Because now she knows that, oh, my husband, that threw Joseph in jail, 
now works for Joseph. The delay that God uses sometimes is for a very spectacular purpose. Sometimes it is to mold us in ways that we cannot imagine. I just recently read a book written by Elizabeth Elliot. Elizabeth Elliot, just to remind you, was the, the very young, young woman, recently married, uh, a young child on the way, and she and her husband, Jim Elliot, went to minister as missionaries to the Oka Indians. And the Oka Indians uh, murdered Jim Elliot, her husband. This is a woman who is acquainted with pain and suffering. And she wrote a book called Suffering is Never for Nothing. And we'll forgive the bad grammar. It's a good book. I commend it to you. Suffering is Never for Nothing by Elizabeth Elliot. I became quite intrigued early in the book because the foreword was written by Joni Erickson Tada, another woman familiar with pain and suffering. You'll remember as a, I believe, 19-year-old girl, she had a swimming accident and became a paraplegic. I was intrigued to find out that in 1976 in Canada, these two great women met at a conference. I was very interested in what these two women, having spent some time together, would conclude. And here is what Joni Erickson Tata wrote in her foreword. We agreed that no one participates in God's joy without first tasting the afflictions of his son. We agreed that no one participates in God's joy without first tasting the afflictions of his son. We have to recognize that there are times when we are being asked to be patient while God is cre creating in our lives something that we just could never ever have imagined. George Matheson is a name that you may not be familiar with. He was a young man uh, who was in seminary. He was wanting to become a brilliant, uh, he was about to become a brilliant theologian. He was doing well in school. He fell in love with a young girl. They got engaged and it looked like his future was bright. One would look at George Matheson in seminary and say, this man's future is good indeed. His eyesight started to go quickly, which led ultimately to absolute blindness. And the young woman who was engaged to him signed off. She said, I, I didn't sign on to be the wife of a blind man. What a horrible event for George Matheson. And in that time and moment, we are told that he writes a hymn. You may know the hymn. Oh, love that will not let me go. I rest my weary soul in thee. I give thee back the life I owe, that in thy ocean depths its flow may richer, fuller be. If you're going through a challenge today, circumstance that seems to have the best of you. Remember that the author of Hebrews is saying in our praise as a sacrifice comes the joy that God wishes to give us. There is great power in praise. I, I was reading just recently in Psalm 8. If you haven't been in Psalm 8 recently, go back and have a read. It's a wonderful it's a wonderful little psalm. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. Did you hear that? <laughs> The majesty of God is so amazing that the praise of infants silences the foe. The praise of infants silences the foe. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name. If you're a follower of Christian contemporary music, you'll know the name Natalie Grant. 
she has just recorded within the last year or so a song. It's on YouTube. I would invite you to go and to listen to it. It is called, I Will Praise You in This Storm. Interesting. I will praise you in this storm. Do you notice that there's no credit and debit in God's economy? We can't say to God, so I'm a little low today. I'm not going to praise you. Uh, I, I was pretty good about praising you last month. And I, I'd like to think that I've got a credit balance on the praise side of things, God. So today, not going to praise you. Could you just apply some of my credit balance for this morning, please? We know, of course, that that is just not so. The author of Hebrews, let us continually offer to God our sacrifice of praise. And for some of us today, would you agree with me? It is in this storm. Well, we've talked about the past tense, through Jesus, therefore. We've talked about the present tense. Let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. I want to discuss now the last portion of this verse, and it clearly drives us towards what I believe is the future tense. Here's what the author says in verse 14. For here, we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for the city that is to come. It's obvious that he is forcing our thoughts to heaven at the last. The fruit of lips that openly profess his name. You ever wondered what you're going to do in heaven? It seems to be a topic of great interest these days. Everybody wants to know what's going to occur in heaven. Well, of course, the answer is in the book of Revelation. A little bit of tough sledding at times, isn't it? If you've been in there a fair bit, you know it's a it's a book of many interpretations, and it's a it's a little tough at times. But I love some of the recurring themes and threads that run through the book of Revelation. I love the start of Revelation 4:11. Forgive me, I'm going to go into the King James here. I'm I'm not a young man anymore. Thou art worthy to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they were and are created. You were created for God's pleasure. And that is going to endure and endure for eternity. When we move over to the very next chapter in Revelation, the fifth chapter, John the Revealer is having an interesting moment. So he is being walked through by the mighty angel. He's being walked through heaven. And they get to a spot where there is a scroll. And the angel says, who is worthy to open the scroll? Would you agree with me, particularly if you're a student of history? There have been people down through the ages who would put their hands up. I'm worthy. Alexander the Great. Napoleon, Hitler. History is replete with people who thought they were worthy, who thought they could control the world. Napoleon said while he was on Elba, man proposes, but God disposes. When the angel asks and John the Revealer is there, who is worthy to open the scroll? There is silence. And John begins to weep because he believes there is no one who is able to open the scroll. Why is Good Friday good? Listen, here's now, here's why. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne. A little further down, we hear the following. The 24 elders are falling before the lamb and they are singing. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language, people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom, priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. The 24 elders singing a new song, worthy is the lamb. 
Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands, 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. And in a loud voice, they sang, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. The 24 elders are singing, worthy is the lamb. The angels, 10,000 times 10,000, worthy is the lamb. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be praise, honor, glory, and power forever and ever. What are you going to do when you get to heaven? Many things I'm quite confident we will do. Read Revelations 21 about how gorgeous and beautiful heaven will be for us. But clearly what the John the Revealer is wanting us to understand and what he observed in the vision uh, of heaven through Revelation 4, 5, 6 is that we will be singing and proclaiming his name. Worthy is the lamb. This is what the author of Hebrews wants us to get to understand. For here we do not have an enduring city. But we're looking for the city that is to come through Jesus. Therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. Let's get used to doing it now, friends, because we're going to do it for eternity. It has been an honor to worship with you this morning at Huron Bible Chapel on this very special Good Friday. What is good about Good Friday? It's all about Jesus and what he did on that cruel cross on Golgotha, outside of the camp, in disgrace and disfavor, and took on sin for you and me. It's all about the present, so that we can continually and have the power to provide praise to our Lord, regardless of our circumstances, even if it's a sacrifice of praise. And he has given us a sure eternity, a place where we will be able to worship and praise and sing the worthiness of the slain lamb. That's why Good Friday is called Good Friday. God bless you, friends.